To escape the double bind, human enterprise has to contract, not grow. The business as usual approach of industry and their hand puppet governments is a prime illustration of one of the few things on earth that is unlimited, the human capacity for self-delusion. The necessary changes require a fundamental reorientation of human values. There are a lot more calls like these coming out as a dismal realization is sinking in for those not in full-blown denial. I took the excerpt quoted from a recent post I received from Greenpeace. It is in reference to Hothouse Earth, the article by several Courage Came Late scientists that predicts a possible sudden and irreversible plunge into mass extinction within a decade. Why did it take these scientists so long to start talking about methane and irreversible feedback loops? If they are correct, this presentation will just be a form of pre-mortem. I have known about the self-reinforcing feedbacks mentioned in the article and the concept of a tipping point of no return since 1998 when I joined the cheery discussion at dieoff.org. Economists have also been peddling blatant nonsense and for the same reasons. Given the ecocidal outcome, I hold both professions to be criminally negligent. However, they are guilty of telling us what we want to hear, which makes us guilty too. In observing human behavior, it would seem that collectively we are no smarter than the bacteria we use to make wine. We are driven by our DNA to multiply and consume until we either run out of resources or pollute ourselves to death. However, we have many examples of societies that have been sustainable over long periods of time, so I don't buy that self-destruction is hopelessly hardwired into our psychology. Neither is the imperative to pursue endless exponential growth. By my analysis, there is a grow or collapse imperative built right into our money system by its arithmetic alone. This is the crucial technical obstacle to successful adaptation. Being mathematically dependent on constant exponential growth is incompatible with the purposeful shrinkage of economic activity and the development of a conservation economy. The money system is not an immutable law of physics. It is something we can change if we have the will to do so. I believe that anyone aware of our real situation needs to understand that the design of the money system itself must change in order to reverse the ecocidal trend. So, proceeding on the assumption that our fate is not yet sealed, which may of course be my own form of denial, I am presenting my, as far as I know, unique analysis of our money system, with the aim of proving to you that our concept of money as a limited quantity made valuable by its own scarcity is the invisible mathematical cause of the grow or collapse imperative today, as it has been the invisible root cause of recurrent debt crises throughout history. I also aim to prove, with the simplest of facts and logic, that modern banking is an ecocidal Ponzi scheme by design. However, don't jump to the conclusion that anyone working in a bank is a consciously guilty party, even the manager. The fog of money is pretty thick. In my experience, bank employees don't question where money comes from any more than the general public. Neither do economists, legislators, or bureaucrats. There are many progressive voices calling for a new economic paradigm. Not one that I am aware of even questions the concept of money itself. I will conclude with a brief description of my proposal for fundamentally changing the nature of money to eliminate the grower collapse imperative. This requires bringing back, with today's technology, 
the original form of money from 6,000 years ago. It is an alternative concept of money as a time-limited promise of goods and or services from a specific source. Instead of producers and consumers each borrowing from banks as in the current system, the producers borrow directly from the consumers by paying for production with promises of what is produced. This parallel form of money has always existed and today transacts an estimated 20% of world trade business to business. According to my analysis of the problem, what is needed is to combine this type of money with the current system. I shall begin with a primer on what money currently is and hopefully dispel some common misconceptions. As for my qualifications, I can read and think. All of my research has been as a self-directed individual. My unique analysis arises from exploring primary sources of information published by several central banks. My 2006 animated movie explaining our money system swept the world during the 2008 crash and in 2014, the Bank of England, in an unprecedented report, corroborated my description of how money is created. Finally, I have suspected our survival would be threatened by our own behavior ever since grade 11, the year we explored exponential functions. It was also the year, 1964, that I first read about the Alberta Tar Sands Project. So, here we are. Given the importance of money in people's lives, isn't it a bit surprising how unquestioning we are about it? Especially economists. They just assume that money is a neutral barter object that can be ignored. How handy for the bankers! Primer. Common misconceptions about money. Fallacy number one. Banks lend depositors money. Actually, they don't. However, they still need deposits as if they did. I bet that's confusing. That is because the consensus belief, the one we've been led to believe since childhood, is a misconception that puts the cart before the horse. Money is created by its borrowers. Money is a borrower's promise to pay it back to a chartered depository institution a bank, trust company, or credit union, almost always on a rigid time schedule. For purposes of this presentation, I'll just call all three of these money creation enablers banks. How is it done? Very simply. I, the borrower, promise the bank $100,000 plus interest over time. This is worth $100,000 to the bank as an asset at this moment. To balance the bank's books, a matching liability is created. A bank account for the borrower with $100,000 just typed in. The borrower now has $100,000 to spend. No existing money is required to do this. The banks only need to have enough cash on hand to convert bank credit to physical cash when we ask for it. Typically, banks keep a cash reserve of about 3% of their promises to provide it. That is because normally, only small amounts are spent in cash. Most large money transfers are just numbers, moving from one bank account to another. What is money? It is really, really simple. All money is principal debt to a bank. Cash is principal debt owed to the central bank on which only the interest is paid so the cash remains in existence. Bank credit, the vast majority of money, is comprised of someone's principal debt to a retail bank to be repaid and extinguished on time. The national money unit, in our case the Canadian dollar, is an undefined unit of measurement of bank credit which is revalued moment to moment by international currency speculation that dwarfs the real economy. Physical cash is labeled as legal tender, meaning the courts will enforce a demand to be paid in cash as a final settlement. This creates the impression that cash is the bedrock foundation of money. It isn't. 
in practical terms, cash is actually just a vehicle for physically transferring bank credit anonymously. So, what happens when this newly created $100,000 of bank credit is spent by the borrower? The seller now has it in his or her account. The seller's bank now owes the seller $100,000 of legal tender on demand. And the borrower's bank owes the seller's bank $100,000 of central bank reserves. Now, the simplest case would be that the borrower and the seller use the same bank. All that is required is to move the numbers from the borrower's account to the seller's. If the seller uses a different bank, then the borrower's bank owes the seller's bank $100,000 in central bank reserves. Again, the simplest case would be that the seller's bank created $100,000 for borrower 2, which was spent and deposited at borrower 1's bank, so that the debts cancel out. Reality is much messier with many banks and transactions that cancel each other out. Remaining imbalances are corrected by the deficient bank borrowing reserves from the bank with a surplus at the interbank rate, so that overall, the principle holds true that the banking system functions as one bank. If you've followed the explanation so far, then you can now see that banks have no direct need of our deposits to make loans. They just need the new bank credit money they created or its equivalent to be deposited back in the banks it came from. That applies to anything the banks buy, including real estate and corporate stocks. New bank credit money to buy real estate or stocks is created as a liability asset pair on the bank's books, just as a so-called bank loan is. To move our money for political reasons is real democracy. A successful movement that drives deposits towards local credit unions will definitely hurt the banks and help the credit unions. That makes it a good thing. However, the bank's product is interest-bearing debt. Any damage to their bottom lines will be incentive to find new sources of income. That might be equally objectionable. The ideal outcome would be for the renewables industry to have an offer the banks can't refuse or, better still, its own depository institutions. A bank dedicated to funding renewables just needs the money it creates, or its equivalent, to come back to it as deposits the same way any bank does. Fallacy number two. Interest can't be paid because it wasn't created. It is an obvious idea once you understand that all money is created as principal debt to a bank. It follows that no money was created to pay the interest. P is less than P plus I for any positive value of I. This leads to the simplistic conclusion that the money supply must constantly grow to make it possible to pay the interest, and that therefore interest is the root of the grower collapse imperative. Most people encounter this fallacy in the parable of a banker and ten people on a desert island. If you did, realize that the story is logically true, but misrepresents reality to create an imaginary problem. The way bank loans are paid back in installments over time returns the interest to circulation after each payment, which makes it impossible for there ever to be a mathematical shortage of money to pay interest. Any shortage experienced is caused by a lack of opportunity to earn, which applies equally to the principal. It does not mean there is a mathematical shortfall in the system due to the charging of interest. This is not to deny the stress that mounting compound interest can cause, nor pass judgment on the morality of it. It is simply to illustrate that flow makes it possible to pay any amount of interest from the principal alone. After all, that 20 in your wallet won't just buy something once. How many times did it buy $20 worth of something before you got it? How many times after you spend it? It is no different when $20 is paid to a bank as interest. The difference is when it is paid to a bank as a principal payment. In that case, it ceases to exist and can only be replaced by a new money creation loan.
fallacy. Number three, governments and or central banks control the supply of money via fractional reserve. They could, but they don't. It was clearly proven that in the USA, increases in reserves followed increases in commercial bank lending. In the same paper, the authors referred to the fractional reserve system, the idea that reserves limit bank lending, as a myth. Canada officially phased out this myth in 1991. The USA continues the pretense. At all times, when banks ask for reserves, the central bank obliges. Reserves, therefore, impose no constraint. And because of this, private banks are almost fully in control of the money creation process. This isn't quite the whole truth either. That is because it is the borrowers that control the expansion of the money supply. Banks can close the loan spigot, but they can't force us to borrow. And, like all creatures of nature, borrowers have their ups and downs, often in concert. But the money system has no respect for the rules of nature, and by virtue of its hidden Ponzi scheme design, all downturns and growth of principal debt to banks, for any reason, including irrational moods and debt saturation, beget crises of mathematically inevitable debt default that devastate both the borrowers and, when severe, the banks. Economists don't get it and don't want to. What do the economists have to offer in the way of prediction or explanation? It was caused by too much debt relative to GDP. It was a string of dominoes set off by the default of subprime borrowers. No, it was the collapse of derivatives. The real question should be, why is it a string of dominoes? How is it that our money system collapses like a house of cards? And which game metaphor is most accurate? What economists do not get is that banking is a game of musical chairs in which losers are an integral part of the game. The music is a growing money supply that earns the bank's interest. And when the music stops, the bankers take some of our chairs, our real stuff. A growing money supply can only be created by ever increasing principal debt to banks. The banks can turn off the money supply anytime they want, but they can't force people to borrow. So when money creation borrowing slows down, for any reason, including public mood, some borrowers default through actual shortage of money. It's not the interest that is the problem, it's the principle. I'll bet it has never occurred to you that your failure to get into debt to a bank for a certain amount and by a certain time might be the remote and invisible cause of someone else losing their house. But that is exactly what I am saying. That is how the arithmetic works. Now, wait a minute, you might object. If all money is created as principal debt to a bank and interest is spent, as was said earlier, then there must always be enough money in existence and available to pay the principal back to the bank. If you search online for the term economics flow diagram, you will find pages of them, all omitting how money is created, the design of the banking system, savings, and lending by non-banks. And this is called an education in economics. Let us follow the money. While the real world is hopelessly complex to try to model, that complexity can be made quite manageable by adopting certain perfectly justifiable simplifications. For the reasons explained earlier, interest can be assumed to be mathematically available and can, therefore, be omitted from this demonstration. That reduces the complexity to four distinct elements. Money creation by banks, including repayment, earning and spending, saving at banks, and the lending of existing bank credit money by non-banks which can be institutions, corporations, or individuals. The simplest scenario is the one economists assume. A dollar is created as a borrower's debt to a bank and spent by the borrower. The dollar is earned and spent in a succession of transactions until the original borrower earns it 
and pays it back to the bank, which extinguishes the dollar. If it is saved, it is assumed to be later spent, so that it all works out fine. The needed money is always mathematically available for the borrowers to repay their debts. There's no need for concern, just move along. This is a dereliction of duty to the public. If the dollar is part of a mortgage, it might be in circulation for up to 30 years. What else might happen to a dollar of bank credit during that broad expense of time? Well, it could be earned by someone who deposits the dollar in a savings account at a bank and keeps it as savings indefinitely. That enables the bank receiving the savings deposit to create a new dollar as another borrower's principal debt. The result is two concurrent principal debts of a dollar and only one dollar available. The dollar could also be earned and lent to a third borrower by a non-bank lender. Now there are three concurrent principal debts of a dollar and only one dollar available. This process can go on and on in any combination imaginable until the original borrower earns the dollar and extinguishes it, leaving behind multiple principal debts for which no money exists. Total principal debt far exceeds the money available to pay it. That means that successful repayment of current principal debts is completely dependent on the creation of new principal debt at or greater than the currently required rate of repayment. So it is mathematically inevitable that whenever new money creation slows down, for any reason, it causes some borrowers to default due to the shortage of new money, just like when the music stops in musical chairs. The only way to keep the music playing is to keep borrowing ever greater amounts of new bank credit into existence from banks, just like a Ponzi scheme, a recognized form of fraud. This is what every economist and banker I have challenged has denied. This is what more than 150 economist reviewers censored me from saying in a science journal. It is little wonder that the economics profession didn't predict the crash of 2008 and are still struggling to find an explanation. As in the case of the cowardly climate scientists, the explanation is politically unacceptable and thus a huge risk to their careers. More effective still is that in the case of economists, the explanation lies outside the bounds of their formal education and thus they have no language for it. Here are two of the short animations I made previously that examine the same issue from different angles. The first I created after debating a well-known economics author and several sovereign money reformers. The second I created after debating a senior economist who has worked for the IMF, the World Bank, and the Fed. Why are economists so clueless? It's because the busy squirrels with economics degrees have only nut pile notions of what money really is. Take this chart of the money supply provided by the U.S. Federal Reserve. The line M1 is cash plus the total amount of money in checking account. M2 is M1 plus the total amount of money in savings account. Note that M2 is normally about four times M1. To economists, M2 is like the total amount of nuts in a pile, and M1 is that portion of the nuts being spent in active commerce. So where's the problem? But the reality is that almost all of this so-called money is actually bank credit, created as a scheduled promise to pay it back to a bank. The Bank of England confirmed this in 2014. Therefore, M2 is actually the total amount of principal debt to banks on which borrowers are making principal and interest payments. 
and M1 is the small portion of that debt money possibly available to be earned to make those payments. There's more. Banking practice allows banks to replace savings with new loans. Therefore, the only way M2 can be four times M1 is that every dollar created as M1 has been saved and replaced by banks three times over. Therefore, every dollar in M1 is owed as principal debt to a bank four times over. Try coming up with any other explanation. But don't try telling this to the pile of nuts economists. Their shell of professional ignorance won't crack, and one can readily understand why they can't admit the obvious. Their squirrely ideas have cost us all dearly. What inspired this animation is my recent email conversation with a semi-retired economist at the IMF who has moved in the highest circles of central banking worldwide. I will just call him Mr. IMF as his identity is not the issue. It has been my experience that every economist I've engaged in has presented me with the same impenetrable illogic. At one point, he dismissed all my fact and logic-based arguments with this simple visual model of how he claims the money system works. I was intrigued by the five-year-old's comment that the water flowing out of the swan's mouth in the little pond in my front yard wasn't overflowing my pond, while his smarter seven-year-old sister didn't understand why the water sucked up by the other swan wasn't draining the pond. I assured them that when they grew up, it would all make sense to them. In Mr. IMF's picture of how money works, the money just flows in a lovely circle from the pond to the input swan's mouth and back out the output swan's mouth to the pond. I don't even know what he is modeling. In this standard economics flow diagram, there isn't any money creation, banks, savings accounts, or non-bank lenders. It too shows a seamless flow. If it is banking or the whole money system he is modeling, he left out savings accounts and non-bank relenders. Can we build a water fountain analogy that more accurately represents the banking and money system? I think so. It is just common sense logic once you know the facts, and all of my facts have been verified by the Bank of England's 2014 report money creation in the modern economy. All of my evidence comes from the U.S. Federal Reserve. First, we need a design that accurately reflects how banking is structured. And for that, we actually need just one simplifying rule to build our model. Money is principal debt to a bank on a repayment schedule. This simplification is justified because most money is created as mortgages or other time payment debt. Therefore, the outflow from the fountain swan must be a demand, namely the demand for exactly the same amount of water per unit of time that had previously been sucked up by its mate. This is because water entering the input pipe represents the principal portion of a bank loan that must be repaid in full. By whom? By the debtors all trying to stay afloat in the pond. In this water analogy, I shall make our starting point a demand for 10 liters per minute from a supply of 10 liters per minute. Now, let's add an elastic storage tank to the system. This represents savings accounts at banks. The water in the pond and the water circulating in the pipes represents the available money from which all debts must be paid. Other than extinguishment of principal debt to a bank and the creation of new water via the input swan, nothing that happens in the pond can ever change the total volume of water. What happens in the pond stays in the pond. Previously, I showed you the standard economics flow diagram. All of that activity takes place within the pond. Now, 
Let's divert a steady portion of the flow, for example, one liter per minute into the tank. In order to maintain the required flow of 10 liters per minute, we need to increase the input to 11 liters per minute. But the output swan always demands exactly the same amount that came into the input in the previous minute. So if we increase the input to 11 liters per minute, the output demand also increases to 11 liters per minute. If we then increase the input to 12 liters per minute, the output demand also increases to 12 liters per minute, and so on. Because one liter per minute is still going into the tank, no matter what we do, we will always be one liter per minute short until the diversion stops. Let's imagine that the diversion stops when the tank is full to 10 liters after 10 minutes. The system is now in equilibrium. The full tank is overflowing and returning the one liter per minute to the flow. There is no further need for accelerated creation of new principal debt to banks as long as the outflow and inflow of the tank remain the same. However, the required flow had to be increased one liter per minute for every liter that went into the tank. Therefore, it is now 20 liters per minute. The demand for repayment of principal to banks has doubled in rate. Can the debtors keep up? Mr. IMF made these comments. There is a limit to how much debt people can service, and that limit comes from the size of their income. Debt is service from income. Default has nothing to do with whether the tank expands or contracts. I disagree. I just demonstrated with simple logic that expansion of the tank requires continuous acceleration of both the input and output rates due simply to the fact that money is created as principal debt on a schedule. Also, the total volume of water in the system has increased. How is that possible? It is possible because this fountain is a model of a bank. The input bank swan sucks in principal payments and extinguishes them. The input bank swan then creates new water as principal debt in response to the demand for it. The accelerated rate of flow is, therefore, the result of an increase in the total amount of water in the system. It is also obvious that for all debtors to extinguish their principal debt to banks, all of the water must be extinguished, leaving the system completely dry. Now let's shrink the tank and see what happens. By shrinking the tank, we are returning more water back into the flow. We can now reduce the input of water. The same governing rule also works the opposite way. The reduction of input results in a subsequent reduction in demand. Eventually, if we empty the tank, we return to the original volume and rate of flow of water, the simple equilibrium imagined by Mr. IMF. However, if we keep expanding the tank, water demand just keeps rising until, at some point, the real-world borrowers can't borrow anymore. There just isn't enough additional water being supplied fast enough. The fountain swan gets really thirsty. If the same water is being recycled through several swan fountains, they all get really thirsty. Who are the other swans? The other swans represent every institution, business or individual that lends their own existing bank credit money. Because the non-bank swans relend existing money they own, the input and output are always the same as principal repaid is principal relent. Because all of them are relending the water from the bank swan, which was itself created as principal debt to a bank, every one of their loans is an additional principal debt of the same money. Therefore, all of the non-bank debtors are dependent on the bank swan always, without fail, maintaining or increasing the total volume of water. If the bank's input swan fails to do so, all of the non-bank swans will go thirsty. A swan going thirsty means, in the real world, mathematically certain debt default, business and mortgage default, losing homes and or jobs like millions of Americans and people in Europe did in 2008. Once we understand the model properly, we can accurately interpret the real-world evidence provided in this case, by the Federal Reserve. Once we do that, the mystery of the thirsty swans and its relevance to recent history should be solved.
Here is a chart over time of M1 in the USA, defined as checking and cash in the hands of the public. In our model, it is the water potentially available to be earned by the public in the pond. Here is M2, which is M1 plus bank account saving. Savings are the water in the storage tank. Therefore, M2 is analogous to the total water in our circulating system. It's a harmless image if you only see money as water, a positive thing. If you see it accurately as someone's principal debt to a bank on a schedule, a negative thing, then M2 is total principal debt to banks, a big hole, and M1 is the small portion of money potentially available to fill it at any given time. Therefore, the space between M2 and M1 represents the proportion of bank credit money created as someone's debt on a repayment schedule that is not available to them. Why? Because someone else has it in their savings account and you cannot pay your debts with my savings, can you? Here's what Mr. IMF had to say about savings being unavailable to the debtors that created that money and need it to extinguish their principal debt to a bank. If people wanted to, they could pay off all debt and the tank would be empty. So what? Apparently, the complete lack of any reason whatsoever for savers to pay off the debts of borrowers they don't know and will never meet doesn't prevent this from being Mr. IMF's solution. And if all debts were paid off, there would be no money. I am baffled why he would say such a thing. Using our water analogy, whenever the space widens, the tank is filling up and expanding requiring an ever-increasing rate of new principal debt creation to prevent mathematically inevitable default. Whenever it narrows, the tank is shrinking, returning liquidity to the flow and reducing the mathematical imperative to create more debt to banks. Whenever the space between these lines stays the same, we have a temporary equilibrium. The predictable results have been peaks in residential mortgage defaults and or business bankruptcies whenever the tank expands for a few years in a row, causing multiple swans to go thirsty. The gray areas indicate official U.S. recessions, the gold line, residential foreclosures. Here, M1 and M2 diverge. A peak in residential foreclosures follows. Again, M1 and M2 diverge, with M1 staying flat. What does that mean? During that span of four years, every dollar created as M1 checking, someone's new principal debt to a bank on a schedule, went into someone else's savings and stayed there. A recession and wave of business defaults follows. Then again, a recession with peaks in both mortgage and business defaults being the result all to be repeated on an unprecedented scale in 2008. And note that, since 1981, the only time the tank actually shrank and returned liquidity to the flow was the highly prosperous period from 1992 to 95. At all other times depicted, the continuous growth of principal debt to banks was a mathematical necessity to prevent mass default. By 2008, the gap between M1 and M2 had reached an unprecedented size due to increasing income inequality and resulted in the greatest wave of debt default since the Great Depression. Have I solved the mystery of the thirsty swans to your satisfaction? Facts, logic, simple arithmetic, and real-world evidence have been offered. If you think I am wrong, Please demonstrate where my facts, logic, arithmetic, and or evidence are in error. Thanks for watching. A fundamental principle of solving a problem is understanding the problem first. According to what I have just demonstrated, the root of the problem isn't just banking. The same situation could be set up with rich people lending gold coins. A gold coin lent into circulation is money as debt, just like bank credit. Therefore, the root of the mathematical problem 
is our concept of money as a single uniform quantity made valuable by its own scarcity. The proposed solution is the opposite. Money is a non-uniform quantity made valuable by the abundance of real things it is a legal claim upon. This concept of money has always been with us since writing and numbers were invented. My whole website and the two and a half hour animated movie Money is Debt 3, Evolution Beyond Money, are devoted to explaining this very ancient concept of money and how it can be applied with today's technology to be a self-balancing system that, by design, corrects the inherent flaws in the current system and is thus 100% compatible with it. But that is a topic for another presentation. For now, I will conclude with two more previously made animations to illustrate the basics. Reversing the logic of money reverses the logic of business, eliminating the mathematical need for growth. This is crucial for our ability to adapt to the ecological limits of our planet. In medieval times, just like today, people had problems with money. In those days, gold and silver coins were the universally accepted form of money. Precious metals were used as money because their scarcity made them valuable, even in small quantities. Unfortunately, it also made them scarce. Two other qualities made precious metals useful as money. They didn't spoil and they did not get consumed. So they were ideal for saving. Unfortunately, the same properties made them ideal for hoarding. Hoarding worsened the problem of scarcity. Those who had wealth beyond their needs could acquire the metal coins and hold on to them, thus depriving everyone else of the money they needed to enable the convenient trading of real goods and services. As a result, Though the weekly market always offered a wealth of goods and services to be traded, there was often very little coin available to make trade work efficiently. So, what did medieval folks do to solve their coin shortage problem? They invented market money, and this is how they did it. Each seller had a pretty good idea of what his or her sales would be if sufficient coins were available. Thus, sellers had a basis upon which to issue credit to themselves. This self-issued credit could then be used as money to buy other sellers' wares. People could do this because the participants at the weekly market were both producers and consumers. They went to the market to trade their products, literally. But what happened when the butcher wanted to buy something from the seamstress, but the seamstress wanted something from the shoemaker, not the butcher, and so on? Trading goods and services for other goods and services required coordination of many trades. It often required several steps before a seller could acquire what he or she really wanted to buy. Bartering like this has always been a cumbersome process. That's why money was invented. And sometimes money has to be reinvented. So one day, during an economic slowdown caused by a serious shortage of precious metal coins, that happened. Anton the baker, whose bread was always in demand, could easily count up the people he knew would buy his bread if they had the money. 
Anton could reliably expect to sell at least 20 silver pennies worth of bread at each market. Therefore, he reasoned, he could safely issue 20 silver pennies worth of Anton's bread vouchers and persuade his fellow sellers to accept this virtual bread in trade for their actual wares. Anton was a good man, trusted by all, so he had little trouble spending his 20 pennies worth of bread vouchers on the wares of other merchants. Most were able to understand the elegance of his idea right away. So those who had traded their wares for Anton's vouchers were, in turn, successful in trading said vouchers for other sellers' goods and services. Because the bread voucher's value was expressed in silver pennies, everyone knew what the voucher was worth relative to everything else. And they knew that every voucher was backed by the abundant supply of Anton's delicious smelling bread. So Anton's bread vouchers were soon recognized by all as reliable money based solely on the proven demand for Anton's bread. Throughout the day, Anton's vouchers would be returned to him in exchange for bread. Each voucher had completed a unique journey through the market, some short and some long. And all along the way, the vouchers facilitated trades that had nothing to do with Anton. It wasn't long before other producers began writing vouchers against their products and services. Soon the market was flooded with money in the form of virtual goods and services, all of it backed by the abundance of actual goods and services available at the market. With no shortage of money, everyone had unrestricted opportunity to sell their products or special skills to whatever extent there was real demand for them. This led to general prosperity and happiness. The only purpose silver served in this system was to provide a widely understood measure of value, in the same way that inches and feet, pounds and ounces were necessary for measuring lengths and weights. Anton liked to explain to the amazed people from other markets, no one has ever stopped from building a house due to a shortage of inches. And similarly, no one in this market is ever stopped from making a trade by a shortage of silver pennies. At the end of each market, outstanding vouchers were reconciled amongst the market merchants, with payments made in three ways. In product, in vouchers for the next market, or, as a final resort, in coin. This system was very successful. That's because it fulfilled the essential purpose of money, it guaranteed the existence of enough purchasing power to purchase all goods and services in demand. Let's imagine your dad gives you 10 bucks to go to the movies on Saturday afternoon, as long as you promise an hour of lawn mowing in exchange. Because he knows the debt can be enforced, he lets you write him an IOU. Because both your dad and the next door neighbor know the debt can be enforced, your dad can trade your IOU to the neighbor, who can, theoretically, sell it to someone else in the neighborhood. If widely trusted, your IOU could even function as local money, circulating to enable exchanges of all kinds until someone who wants their lawn mowed calls you up and lets you extinguish the IOU. The IOU specified who was to deliver what to whom, in this case the bearer, and because you didn't want it hanging over you forever, you put an expiry date on it. Therefore, your IOU created a complete circle from credit issuance to credit redemption within a time limit. 
The IOU had a life cycle, like everything in nature. Your IOU created guaranteed employment for you because you were not obliged to pay back the $10 debt in money, only one hour of lawn mowing. Therefore, a widespread shortage of money or a general lack of job opportunities could have no effect on your ability to fulfill your promise. This is definitely not the case with bank credit. If I borrow $1,000 from a bank, I sign a contract to pay it back in cash or bank credit within a certain time. Therefore, my ability to pay it back depends on the amount of money in existence and how much of it is available to me to be earned. But according to this chart, most of the money created as a debt on a schedule is locked away indefinitely in someone else's bank saving. The circle from credit creation to credit redemption is broken. The result is that previous principal debt can only be extinguished with new principal debt. Therefore, the current system is dependent on sufficient and timely new borrowing to prevent previous borrowers from losing their homes to the banks. Defaults and evictions are mathematically inevitable every time new borrowing from banks slows down for any reason, thus locking us into the perpetual growth imperative that is leading us to extinction. Mutual credit systems are a huge improvement that don't complete the circle either. Imagine I sell you a custom-made bicycle for $1,000 in mutual credit. I now have $1,000 more credits within the system than I can spend with anyone else in the system. You have $1,000 less. My credit has been created by the sale and delivery of a real thing, and bank debt at interest has been avoided. Impossible math has also been avoided. This is all excellent. But my $1,000 credit within the mutual credit system does not define what real goods and or services are to be delivered in return. Not when, not where, and not by whom. Like bank credit, the design of mutual credit also fails to complete the circle from credit creation to credit redemption. There is no built-in dynamic that forces circulation and balances trade relationships inherently. The producer credit system does complete the circle by design. In a producer credit system, I, as an approved issuer, pay you $1,000 in my producer credits in exchange for your goods and services. My producer credits are contracts for delivery of my goods and services within a certain time, backed up by a claim on my equity if I default. Thus, producer credits are legally enforceable debt. My producer credits can be saved or spent like money until maturity at which point they must be redeemed from my goods or services or expire. In exchange for the credit extended me and the risk taken by the credit holders, I denominate my producer credits in an inflation-proofed value unit so that credit holders always get back the same value in real goods and services that was initially put in, plus an automatic discount on my prices when redeemed. We observe that everything in nature has a life cycle that cannot be avoided. Therefore, it might be wise to design money the same way. Of the three choices examined, only producer credits completes the credit cycle by design. Producer credits faithfully duplicate all the essential features of that valid IOU you gave your dad. Thank you.